Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Share Screen Africa's Raptor Education Series. I do apologize uh, for speaking to you in the dark, um, courtesy of ESCOM, but I'm hoping that uh, during the course of this talk, the lights will come back on. Nonetheless, uh, it is fantastic to see some of our regular faces and names in the, uh, the audience tonight. But for those of you joining us for the first time uh, on this series, my name is Kaylin Pariachi. I am from the KNAF Conservation Foundation, and I will be your host tonight and for the rest of the series on your bird of prey expedition through the African continent, where we're going to meet some of Africa's most talented and dedicated conservation biologists envir and environmentalists uh, that, that the continent has to offer. So tonight, we're going to be speaking about a very well-known uh, group of, of, of raptors that is spoken about all over the world, but are not necessarily um, seen as the prettiest of the raptors. And those, of course, are our vultures. While they may not, may not be as pretty as some of the, the more charismatic species that we have been speaking about so far in the series, they are by far uh, the most important for uh, or in our, our, our ecosystems, not only in Africa, but throughout the world. So no, you know, who better to chat to us about these phenomenal animals than Dr. Love Leita Sibele um, from BirdLife International. She's going to be chatting to us uh, about uh, these, uh, these, uh, these birds in Zimbabwe. And then she'll be joined by Josephine, who's going to talk to us about her hands-on experience with these, uh, these phen phenomenal birds in uh, Zimbabwe as well. After that, we're going to head all the way to East Africa, Kenya, to chat with our resident raptor specialist, Simon Thompson, where he's going to show us or introduce us to a few of the birds that he has uh, in his facility that he cares for and, and rehabilitates there um, to give us a closer up, uh, an up close look at uh, these phenomenal, phenomenal birds. Uh, again, I would like to encourage you all to keep an eye on that email that you used to to register for tonight's talk with because we will be sending out more of our raptor education posters free of charge for you guys to download and use as you like um, that should be coming out uh, anytime from about 7 30 tonight so as soon as you get them jump onto all your social medias whether it's facebook LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever it is, share it far and wide. Um, this is to 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 share the the knowledge that we're we we're learning about on this series and help the conservation of African raptors uh, as much as we can. And for those of you that may have missed uh, some of our, our talks in this series so far, or if you just want to re-watch some of your favorite talks from the series, you can always visit sharescreenafrica.org. Um, Marit will put up a link to that. Um, oh, here we go to that uh, to that uh, section on their page where you can catch up with all your favorite talks or catch up on the ones that you've that you've missed as we went along. And with that, I think it's about time for us to kick today's session off um, with our headline speaker, uh, speaker for tonight, Dr. Lovelater Sibele. Uh, she is a passionate advocate for Africa's wildlife and its coexistence with humans. With a deep love for learning, Dr. Sibele has dedicated her career to ensuring harmony between humans and wildlife in general. Her major objectives include fostering cross-boundary collaborations and promoting the involvement of more women in conservation, bar, uh, in, in conservation uh, across Africa, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal um, uh, initiative. Uh, her exper experience in conservation biology, specifically the fields of GIS, community ecology, and freshwater ecology, has equipped her with a comprehensive understanding of conservation challenges uh, challenges in Africa. Additionally, her research on factors influencing the timing of breeding in expanding raptors at different spatial scales has contributed to the scientific understanding of wildlife behavior. Dr. Sibeli's dedication and, and diverse knowledge make her an invaluable asset to the field of conservation. Um, and it, with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Lovelater Sibele. Lovelater, the floor is all yours. Uh, let me stop sharing and you can go ahead and share yours. 
Thank you very much, Kaylin. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much um, for making time uh, to hear me speak uh, about vouchers. Um, I work for BedLife International. Uh, I'm the Senior Voucher Conservation Officer for Southern Africa. So I work with the different BedLife partners in different uh, countries within the region. And in some uh, cases, we also work with other organizations uh, working um, in voucher conservation. And through my talk, you will realize why um, that collaboration is uh, very important. Um, so when we talk about um, vultures, um, it is important to note that the world over, there is 23 species of vultures, 16 uh, old world vulture species, and seven new world species. Uh, Africa has 11 species of vultures, and all of these are part of the old world um, vultures. Uh, for us to understand why vultures are important, I'm just going to start off by talking about their physical attributes, um, which make them well adapted for the role that they play uh, in the environment. Uh, vultures are mostly scavengers. They mainly feed on carrion, uh, that is dead animals, although there's a, a, a few species that will sometimes hunt. So even for the species that are hunting sometimes, they are still mainly carrion feeders. So some of the species that are known to sometimes hunt and when they hunt, they also, they actually focus on very uh, small prey species, include the white-headed vulture and uh, the bearded vulture. Uh, so one of the major uh, characteristics of vultures or physical features that make them ideal for what they do is that uh, for, for the 11 species that we have in Africa, nine have bare faces and bare neck, necks, or otherwise very little feathers that you will see on the neck, like the vulture that you're seeing on your left. It's got very little of feathers that look like um, downies, like feathers that you would find on a newly hatched chick. They are very few, most of the skin is bare. Um, and then uh, there's some, there's two species, uh, the bearded vulture and the palmnut vulture, uh, that you will find that they have feathers on their necks. Um, so for these ones that have bare skin, uh, skin on their face and on their necks, it's because this is an adaptation to their way of feeding. Vultures are not scared to get bloody. They will go into the carcass. Sometimes they'll go in, I mean, literally in the carcass. So they, they easily get bloody. So um, having a bare neck makes it easy for them to actually wash off um, after they feed. Um, and uh, also the bare neck helps them to pull off. You realize that for most vulture species, they nest in the open. And in the time that they have chicks on their nests is the time when um, Africa is very hot. So it's way into the summer that they are all still sitting on their nests or taking care of their chicks that are in the nest. So it gets very hot. So um, the bare neck helps them to cool off. And you'll find that sometimes they'll also open their wings to also um, help them to, to cool off. So in terms of uh, their wings, vultures are very big birds um, with the wingspan of the, the, the smallest in Africa has a wingspan of 1.8 meters and the biggest has a, a wingspan of 2.8 meters. So these are really, really large birds. So after a meal, the vultures will actually um, take a bath, as you can see, and uh, wash off that blood. Um, it also helps uh, them to, to, to get rid of parasites that they may have um, gotten from um, a carcass. Uh, so they will wash themselves off and then they will sun in the and, and they will sit in the in the sun, open their wings, um, make sure that their feathers are dry. So yes, they eat carcasses. Yes, it sounds yucky, but they are very um, young birds. Another way in which vultures are, are adapted for the way in which uh, they survive and they, for their role in the environment is that they have strong beaks. Um, on your left is uh, the lappet first vulture, which is the biggest of all vultures in, in Africa with a wing, that's the one that I said is a wingspan of 2.8 meters. It also has the strongest bill. Um, it's hooked and also it's very strong. Um, so it allows it to actually open carcasses. This is the only vulture that is 
able to actually open uh, carcasses of large mammals. So even if other vultures get to a carcass and it's still closed, meaning that there are no other um, um, uh, scavengers, mammalian scavengers and carnivores that have opened it up. So this is the only guy that can actually come through and open a carcass and his bill is adapted for that. On the right, we have a hooded vulture. This is the smallest of them all. Wingspan of 1.8. He's got a very long and thin bill. Uh, he feeds on the scraps of meat that are left on the bone. So the long and thin bill allows him to scrape off bits of meat from the bone and actually to fit in his bill into crevices and actually get some of the meat that is not um, exposed for him to feed on it. But you can also see that it's got a hook to allow him um, to tear off um, pieces of meat as well. The other adaptation for them is the, the, the fit. Uh, you can see on the right that other reptiles have got talons that are, are long, sharp, and hooked. Um, this allows them to puncture um, animals. When they kill them, they, they puncture into these animal skins with their hooks. And for, for some, it allows them to actually hold on to the animal that they want to feed on and carry it off to go and feed somewhere else. You can see the feet of a vulture are different. The feet are weak. Um, the talons are, are not sharp. That's because vultures are not adapted for, for hunting. There has been cases where farmers have said that vultures are feeding on their lambs, on their livestock, and uh, um, that is not true. Vultures do not hunt. They do not tell big things. They, they are not adapted um, for doing that. Another way in which vultures are adapted to their um, function is that they have great senses of sight and smell. And these are the senses that they use in, 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 in identifying or in finding their food. So uh, also in terms of their wings, uh, remember I said that vultures are big. The wingspan is large, it's huge for a bird. So you can imagine flying is not easy. Getting off the ground is not easy. Um, it, it uses a lot of energy, which is why your vultures, often if you look at vultures in the morning, they are actually perched uh, on trees uh, and, 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 and waiting for it to get hot. This is because they depend on thermals to help them uh, to go up into the sky. In this way, they are not using energy. So when the sun hits the ground and creates thermals that are of lighter air and they are hot, the vultures can simply open their wings and, 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 and glide into these thermals and go high up um, into the sky, into the sky. And they are also adapted to, to, to flying at great heights. And at these great heights, um, you can imagine being at a very uh, high vantage point means they are, can actually see a lot of, of, of ground, which makes them um, highly successful at finding carcasses because they are seeing a, a lot of the ground. And um, they fly at heights of over um, 11 uh, kilometers up in the sky. And uh, the highest um, recorded one is, is of almost 12 kilometers. By being able to glide and move around in these thermals, vultures are able to cover large ground. You can imagine if you are feeding on carcasses, um, they are not readily lying out there for you to find. You need to actually be able to fly around and look for them. Um, there is a vulture that we tagged in 2018 in Zambia, and the, the purple dots that you are seeing, they show its movement within a month. Uh, this bird was able to go to four countries in the space of a month. It went to it was taken in Zambia, it went to Zimbabwe, it went to Botswana, it went to Angola. And we nicknamed, nicknamed him uh, the Kaza Ambassador because he managed to go to four of the five Kaza countries within the space of a month. So um, clearly vultures have no respect for boundaries and protecting them means uh, working together across these boundaries. Um, also, it means ensuring that whatever efforts we put in place 
to conserve vultures are not just country based, but should actually cover the, the, the whole range of, um, of, of, of vultures. Um, when vultures are in the sky, when they are high up, they're not just looking at um, the ground for carcasses, but as a vulture in the sky, you're also looking at other vultures in the sky. So you may be sitting in one thermal, or there's a few vultures in the same thermal, and there's other vultures sitting in other thermals. So you're also watching what the other vultures are doing, but you're also watching what the eagles are doing. For example, for an eagle like um, a Batila eagle, that is very good at, at spotting carcasses. If you're a vulture, you're spotting vultures, you're spotting uh, Batila eagles, you're looking at them to see what they are doing. And uh, when they fly, when you see a number of them, or when you see a Batila eagle actually flying a certain direction, you want um, to follow, you want to actually go and see what they have seen. So this is why um, we easily find many, many vultures um, within a carcass, within a short space of time. So it's not because all of these vultures have spotted a, a, a carcass on the ground, but some vultures have just spotted eagles and vultures going a certain direction. And um, um, they know that there must be something in that direction, especially with vultures, which do not want to use um, their energy in flight. So if you see them now moving, um, I mean, disregarding thermals and just moving a certain direction means they are now using their energy. They will only use their energy when they when it's worth it. So when you see them going that direction, you actually want to follow them. Uh, and vultures are, are social. You will find uh, different species of vultures at a carcass uh, within a short space of time. And these vultures are feeding on different parts of the animal. And sometimes some vultures are just standing by and watching and waiting for an opportunity to feed. Even if there is um, uh, scavengers at a carcass, sometimes they'll wait for the scavengers to eat and then they'll eat depending on how friendly uh, the scavengers are being. So uh, vultures need about 500 grams of meat a day. And because they don't find carcasses every day, they have the ability to feed on uh, two cages of uh, meat from a carcass, from a single uh, eating. And you can imagine if you find 500 vultures, um, they're not going to eat 200 kilograms. Uh, I mean, two, two cages, um, they're not all going to eat two cages, but you can imagine there's a possibility of getting a ton of meat off a carcass because of, of having um, 500 uh, birds. So you can imagine how efficient vultures are at getting rid of a carcass. Because of this, uh, we believe that vultures play a very big role um, in disease control. Uh, we know that the stomachs of vultures are, are acidic, highly, highly acidic, which means that vultures are able to feed on diseased carcasses and actually not um, suffer from the diseases that affect that affected um, those animals. And also because of their high efficiency uh, of feeding at carcasses, it, vultures actually reduce the amount of time that carcasses spend in the open. Uh, by doing some research work to see how efficient we, they were, we know that uh, a group of vultures will get rid of an impala carcass in nine minutes, 35 seconds. They will get rid of a, of a zebra carcass in 30 in 30 minutes so uh by being this highly efficient they um reduce the amount of time that carcasses sit out in the open you can imagine in the african heat uh carcasses rot fast uh they become a, a hive for, for for diseases so reducing the amount of time that the carcasses spend out in the open uh reduces the chances of uh, the spread of diseases from diseased carcasses, uh, from rotting carcasses. It also reduces the amount of time uh, that the carcasses are in the open, allowing for carnivores uh, to come through. Because when carnivores start coming to a carcass, it becomes a point of disease exchange between the different species of uh, carnivores um, feeding on that carcass. So reducing that amount of time uh, reduces uh, the rate at which the transfer happens. And also vultures with their acidic stomach and not suffering from these diseases that would otherwise affect the carnivores 
are the only animals that are actually able to stop the spread from a diseased um, carcass. So when we talk about what vultures are able to do for us in the environment, the role which they play in the in the environment, we talk about uh, issues of sanitation, uh, nutrient recycling, um, by feeding on on these uh, carcasses, and also they reduce uh, the time spent by carcasses out in the open, leading to an increase in 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 greenhouse. Uh, gas emission, uh, but there's also the value uh, in vultures uh, in terms of their tourism value and their cultural value, which I'm going to um, talk about uh, in, in a few coming slides. Um, having said that, you then ask yourself, why are we worried about them? They play a great role, but why are we worrying about them? Why is there such a drive to actually um, protect Africa's vultures? Um, in the past 50 years, we have uh, lost at least 97% of Africa's vulture population. And the major threats uh, to these vultures have been poisoning uh, of, of vultures through feeding on uh, poisoned elephant carcasses, lion carcasses, and also the poisoning of vultures, secondary poisoning of vultures by farmers <clears throat> who are intending on actually poisoning um, uh, carnivores, conflict animals, your lions, your hyenas, because they are feeding on their livestock. So they tend to usually um, retaliate by trying to poison these animals and putting out bait, poisoned bait. But because they usually put them in the after, out in the afternoon and these animals are mostly nocturnal and the vultures are the ones out there in the open sky during the day, great eyesight, they easily spot these um, baits and feed on them and end up... Um, uh, dying also uh, from the poison. And then there's the issue of belief-based use where vultures are being used uh, in most parts of Africa uh, for traditional medicine. I'll talk about that a bit more later on. And also vultures uh, die from uh, electrocutions and, and, and collisions. Um, this is because, remember I said vultures love um, to sit and open their wings. So sometimes uh, the areas that provide uh, a good vantage point because when you're a vulture and you just don't want to sit on the ground. You want to sit somewhere where you can see what's happening around you, you can scan the ground. So sometimes they will end up sitting on, on, on pylons, on distribution lines. And when they do that and they open their wings to cool, uh, what often happens is with one wing on, on, on one end of uh, the line and another wing on the other end of the line, vultures tend to complete uh, a circuit and end up being um, dying from uh, electrocutions. Uh, there's also uh, deaths of vultures. Um, there's consumption of vultures in other parts of Africa. And also there is loss of vultures as a loss, as a result of uh, loss of habitats. Um, for example, for our cape vultures, which are cliff, cliff nesters, while they love to nest on cliffs, they don't like to be in environments that have humans, human activity. So um, there's been a lot of, uh, of habitats in areas where um, uh, people have come into uh, vulture um, breeding sites. Uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe, we had only one colony of, of Cape vultures nesting um, in the Shangani area. And uh, when people moved into that area in the early 2000s, those vultures disappeared. Up to today, we do not know where they went. We do not know where they're nesting. We do not know if they even still nest. Um, in the country. Of course, we see an individual bird here and there, but we don't know if they still nest in this area as well. Uh, and then for your vultures that use uh, trees for nesting, like your white-backed vultures, they love to nest on the tallest trees uh, in the area. So when the tallest trees are cut, uh, it means the environment stops being ideal um, for these vultures. So when we talk about the 11 species that we have in Africa, seven of these species are actually endangered. And of these, four are actually um, critically endangered. So I want to talk more about belief-based use. The reason why vultures are used uh, in traditional medicine is because of their ability their good ability to actually spot carcasses. Uh, because of this, 
in the African belief, people believe that vultures dream. So they wake up in the morning and they know where the carcasses are. So people believe that vultures have clairvoyant powers, which they can also use uh, to see, in, to foretell into the future and to communicate with the dead and also to cure uh, various ailments. And uh, in some parts of Africa, you actually go to traditional markets and you will find that these vulture parts are actually sold openly in the market. Um, sometimes uh, they are sold in secrecy and you need to actually um, you need to actually do a lot of uh, investigation for you to to, 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 to determine what parts of vultures uh, they are using and how they are using them. Um, and sometimes in some cases we found people selling traditional medicine, uh, like the one in the in the pink bottle there on your screens. Um, we suspect that there is nothing that comes from a vulture in this bottle of medicine, but because if there's a vulture picture on it, it tends to be easy for people to believe uh, that uh, vultures actually uh, cure diseases. As a result, the market for vultures in Africa is large. Um, we, we, we have, we've been working with traditional healers and we found that in some cases, in countries where they have wiped out their populations of vultures, they are actually getting them from neighboring countries. So there is no one country that is safe, even if within the country there is no belief in the system, but the vultures nesting in that country are not safe because they are being harvested by locals for sale um, across the borders. Uh, and uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, on this one is actually working with uh, traditional healers to actually see if we can find alternatives uh, to vulture medicine. In some cases, we're making good strides where um, healers are actually saying, yes, we can use certain plants uh, instead of the vultures. And where plants, uh, plants have been identified as alternatives, we are also making sure we are not using um, endangered species of, 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 of plants. Um, um, the trade also in vulture medicine is across Africa. Uh, there is part of Africa where um, it's well defined, it's well known, but there's other countries where it's it's very secretive. In 2021, 2,000 vultures were killed within one site, poisoned for use in belief-based um, use. And in Guinea, um, how do you know that vultures have been identified for belief-based use? Usually you will find vultures with missing body parts, a dead vultures with missing body parts then you know that the, those body parts have been harvested for traditional medicine. The most commonly harvested part is the head, but we've discovered that in other countries, they will actually use the different parts of the vulture um, for different things. So you realize that most of the vulture can actually um, be used uh, for traditional medicine. Now, with uh, such high losses of vultures um, having sage, uh, why vultures are important in the ecosystem, there has actually been a lesson to us. We have actually been able to learn from a country that has previously um, lost its vulture population. And um, we, we, we understand the consequences that they suffered. So India lost 95% uh, of its uh, vulture population in the 80s into the 90s. And this was because they were using diclofenac um, to treat an anti-inflammatory drug to treat their, their cattle. So sometimes when these cattle did not heal from this, uh, they would be left out in the open. Being a Hindu country, um, they don't feed on, on, on their cattle, so they would pile them up in some places. And usually the vultures were responsible for getting rid of, 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 of these um, carcasses. But Diclofenac, this anti-inflammatory drug, is actually results in kidney failure in, in, in vultures, which is why they lost their vulture population. And they only realized that they lost their vulture population 
when all of a sudden there was a lot of stray dogs um, everywhere in, 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 in the streets and uh, these stray dogs had rabies and people were just randomly getting bitten um, by rabid dogs. And when they investigated to see why they had this problem, they realized that it was because the vulture population had declined. So generally what happens with animals is animals tend to keep each other's populations in check. So when you remove one species, which is a competitor, you open up space for one species to have more food than it should have or than it had. So these, vulture, the, these dogs actually now were exposed to more food than before. And as a result, the population boomed and these dogs didn't belong to anyone, they were stray and then they had this problem. And to actually get rid of this problem, um, India spent more than 69.4 billion US dollars. That is to try to get rid of the rabies, uh, treat people, um, try and restore um, their vulture population as well. Uh, so they're actually succeeding in, in restoring their population. They're doing very well. Um, the numbers are picking up. Um, so we have learned, we know what can happen. And if you think of it, India was faced with one challenge, diclofenac, which they could easily get rid of. But when you're thinking about Africa and the challenges that we face, uh, the diseases that we face, that vultures are actually helping us control. You talk about your anthrax, your foot and mouth, your botulism. I, I, I believe as Africa, we do not want to get to a point that um, India got to. We, we, I don't think we even have the 69.4 billion, not as, a, as individual countries, but as a continent to actually um, deal with the problem. Because not only would it affect our livestock, but it would affect all our other wildlife species it would affect um, human health. It would really be catastrophic if we got to a point where we lost all our vultures. And what we need to realize as well is that when we lose, where we are losing our vultures, we are losing them in large numbers. People are poisoning one or two elephants, and we're losing 197 vultures at those sites. People are poisoning five elephants, and we're losing 506 vultures at those poisoning sites. Um, having said that. Um, I would like to thank you all for listening to my talk. This is how our vultures have been misunderstood and these are the challenges um, that they are facing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Love Later, for that talk. Uh, definitely something for us all to, to think about. We're going to change the, the 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 program up a little bit and we're going to actually head over to uh, East Africa, to Kenya, to have a look at what... Um, Simon Thompson is doing with the vultures in that part of the world. vulture came in from the Mara, was found near its nest on the ground and it had one, its left leg, the one that's shaking, was all atrophied and didn't really have anything going for it and I thought the chances of recovery were very small. It's fully recovered. It's only shaking right now because it's cold morning and it's sitting in the sun. Anyway, the uh, plan is, is to let him go and this is not going to be easy because his parents have moved on. If he goes back into the same nest he will obviously be chased out he'll not be taken by his parents um actually in the process of training him idea being that when we let him go we'll be able to call and he'll come down and have his meal that's the only way we can make sure that he comes back and that we don't lose him immediately they take a very long time to get independent uh, the lapid is our largest of our vultures in terms of body weight, they're not that he much heavier than a rappel. They just have very, very big wings. Um, they get up earlier in the morning than all the others. They often take off from very short trees on the open plains, catch local thermals and thus get to smaller prey items much quicker than the large gyps vultures, which is the rappels and the, the whiteback. These don't really directly compete with them. 
they have a very large bill that was formerly considered to be the, the carcass opener. These are the tin can opening bill that opens up thick skinned carcasses so that the rest of the gips. Hey, good boy. So the rest of them can come in and um, feed. Well, they're not that altruistic at all. These guys actually wait until the gips open up the carcass, then they move in and eat the small fragments, especially the bony, very cartilaginous pieces such as the scapulars. There are specific places they like to eat, and they like eating heads a little bit more. Certainly very good at eating small carcasses, and they're quite powerful. They can kill when there's a flamingo or pelican nesting colonies, they actually can do quite a lot of damage. We've seen them eat amphrodate, small zebra foals, wildebeest halves, and on occasion we've seen them eating jackals. In fact, that's on YouTube, them actually killing a jackal, but there's no question the jackal was poisoned in the first place, so whoever took that was completely unaware that the vulture was going to die later. They do go into much thicker cover because they fly at a lower altitude earlier in the morning, they can actually pick up a lot of poisoned animals, small stuff like jackals, hyenas. So they are in some ways much more vulnerable to poisoning than you would expect. Lapid faced vultures like to nest on top of short trees, often on very thorny trees. In the Athicapiti, they'd be nesting on the Balanites, and they uh, can actually commute vast distances to their nest. For example, they used to have a lot of nests on Athi, around the Athicapiti plains all the way to Konza and Ulu. There used to be many nests, and then we knew from backpack data that they would fly all the way to the Mara, right through the Kidong, over the top of places like Quenya, go over the Ngurumans and then land in the Mara for a day, eat, and then come back again. They will often regurgitate the food to the chicks, but I've actually seen them carry food, which is really interesting, both in the bill and in the feet which is extraordinary. They are sword swallowers. They can eat sections of bone that are about 30 centimeters and swallow, you know, the legs of, say, a full-grown Tommy in one go. You won't believe until you see it. It's incredible what they can do. And they've got the piece of bone poking out of their mouth. They have only one egg, usually every year. If the previous chick is a little bit sort of backward and hangs around for more than about six months, it may bump the breeding season on a few months each year. Certainly in the central Rift Valley where they used to nest, they would have rather irregular nesting periods that were not that closely related to the rains. But in the Mara Serengeti, where all the wildebeest have a very cyclic austral cycle, where they are triggered by day length, they tend to have quite a set breeding season. Today, much of Kenya they're absolutely vanished within the last 10, 15 years. It's been an extraordinary rapid loss. And I mean, the Athi population is completely defunct. That used to be twice the size of Mara. Now it's, um, you know, filled with various developments such as defunct cities and industrial areas that are just simply not working. And in the central Rift Valley, all the way from the Tanzania border, all the way up to Baringo, I wouldn't be surprised there's not a single nest. Here, next to, between the Kuru and Elementaita, we used to have three known nests in about 2011, and now we're in 2023, and none of them exist. So it's a species that really does need to be managed. Easily done so, we can build artificial nests for them. We can encourage them through vulture restaurants and do what the rest of the world does uh, in order to bring them back. Without that, we will lose them. The massive huge bill on these things is what's important about them. They actually eat like eagles do, as opposed to the gips vultures who have a tongue that actually does most of the chewing up of the food. The tongue of a gips will come in and out like a sewing machine and eat soft tissue. These don't have that ad adaptation. These just eat like large eagles. That's why he's got that big, big, nasty bill. You imagine he can tear your finger off in one go. So yes, they're very powerful. Ow, naughty boy.
These are Rupels. The one with the blue bandage on the left there is just had its wing amputated. Unfortunately, we kept that wing for months and months in the hope that it was going to be uh, okay. I mean, what happened was it had a mid humerus fracture that formed a non union, it just was rotating around. It was found in Ambicelli, weirdly in good condition. Certainly, the fracture was at least six weeks, maybe two months old, even longer. How it could have remained in good condition, one can only conclude it either had found enough dead things to run up to it on foot or be fed by somebody. Anyway, chopping off its wing was the last thing we wanted to do. The whole wing became incredibly arthritic. It had osteomyelitis all the way through it. It was a, a bit of a failure. So we're sitting in there with another one, which has got the entire carpus is missing. So the whole hand is missing, and yet the primaries are growing through without any bone support, which is very odd. And what we're planning to do is to give it an artificial hand, at least give it some sort of structural support. Again, that's a pretty difficult operation. We had to remove a missing phalanges, a missing bone in its digit. That was quite good. That will resolve well. It had huge soft tissue damage all the way through its thigh, straight into the bone of its leg, and that's resolved completely as well. So you can literally have birds who are in captivity for a year, carefully, carefully, kind of pruning off the problems, you know, one at a time, resolving one problem, then the other, then the other. But creating a totally different, you know, artificial hand is, you know, very unique. We have in East Africa, very rarely three different kinds of gips. One is the Rupels, the other is the Whiteback, and the other is the Eurasian Griffin, which is a rare migrant. In Southern Africa, they have another called the Cape Vulture. This is our version of the Cape Vulture. Easily identifiable by them all having these half moon shapes, sort of scattered on their upper wing coverts, on the distal parts of even their primaries, and also across their chest and across the middle of their back. So that half moon shape is pretty much diagnostic. In addition, they have yellow ivory colored bills, at whatever age they may be, even in the nest, they've always got a little bit of ivory tip to their bill. Adults have pale khaki eyes. These are cliff nesters. The whitebacks are tree nesters. Very occasionally, rupels will nest in trees, such as in West Africa, that's been recorded. May even be a case here in the Mara, which Stratton found and Lemaine found. Unfortunately, the egg was unfertile, but it looked like they'd laid a nest on the tree, which would be the first tree nesting record for East Africa. These are, in many ways, better off in terms of the conservation. They nest on cliff faces, a substrate that nobody's yet learned how to cut down, whereas the tree nesting right back has a problem, not just from poisoning, uh, loss of ungulates, loss of food in general, but also their trees will get cut down, whereas the rappels nesting on cliffs, at least they've got those as safe retreats. However, they nest very much colonially. You will get maybe uh, 10 close nesting or up to about 200 close nesting. We don't have the vast, vast colonies like they do with the Cape vultures, although in the Gold Mountains in Tanzania, you do get that kind of similar picture. Here in Kenya, most that you get in one site would be about 200, 250 individuals. Don't really know who's nesting because here vultures can nest all all year round, any time of the year, because the weather is exactly the same. Successful nesting for a vulture obviously depends upon the death of ungulates. So drought would be a very good time for them. Whether they can predict drought and lay eggs prior to the drought, one doubts that. They, within the last 15 odd years, we've gone and done a number of projects on them. They basically, the India, decline from Diclofenac led to there being an increased interest in vultures in Africa. Southern Africa had led the way. Um, we only really got interested in vultures in about 1986 with the success Pan-African Ornithological Congress. Having a talk with Peter Mundy, he said, why are you guys so interested in your falcons and all the glamorous eagles? What about the vultures? And fantastic. Thank you again, uh, Simon, for uh, that wonderful field trip. Uh, we're going to head back down south to Zimbabwe, 
to visit with Josephine Mandava, who's going to be showing us a little bit of uh, uh, on the work that she does uh, with the vultures in Zimbabwe. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to be here and speaking to you on vulture conservation on private lands. And um, in this talk, I'm going to be speaking about Shangani Holistic, which is um, uh, a private property in the Midlands of uh, Zimbabwe. And we find that private properties can actually contribute quite significantly towards conservation because um, owners of private lands will want to have both biodiversity and the landscape and the ecosystem being intact so that they can have, um, they don't have to work or <clears throat> to invest a lot in uh, them trying to rehabilitate. So it makes financial sense for you to look after your landscape for 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 your purposes. And in the in the end you find that um, biodiversity also benefits from the efforts that are being made. Right. And you find that um, most private property owners will find new ways to conserve biodiversity in the landscapes and the ecosystems. And um, uh, as a result our biodiversity will Benefit the landscape benefits, and uh, some even some movement corridors are preserved. And uh, as well, we have increased carbon sequestration from those private lands, increased uh, water quality protection, uh, good erosion control, and increasing pollination services. So, well managed private lands can offer important advantages for biodiversity, particularly in the current human dominated landscapes. We, we want to have those green pockets, so to speak, where we have these well managed lands that are able to offer quite a lot of services for our biodiversity, and biodiversity can benefit. All right. And then back to Shangani Holistic, as I said, this is in Zimbabwe, and uh, this uh, property occurs in the Midlands, by the way. And there are two properties for Shangani Holistic, there's the northern. Part and the southern part, um, just as you can see there. And so in 2014, the first nesting white bed vultures were seen on the farm. Uh, and I say the first because this, this property is a history of um, good biodiversity monitoring. So people are aware or are aware of what they have on the property. So suddenly they see white bed vultures on the area. So that sparked a lot of interest. And um, the monitoring has been ongoing since then. And uh, most of the birds that are nesting there are white birds, yes. We've also seen lapid faced vultures. We've also seen a single in, um, sighting of the nesting white headed vulture. Generally, the birds are clustered, um, looking for tall trees in fairly open um, landscapes. They don't like closed up woodlands because that affects their quality and efficiency. You can see a lot of food, there's a lot of closing up. Uh, on the southern part, they are also clustered nearer to the vulture restaurant that, that was set up to supplement um, their, their feeding. Okay, so they, the parents choose to that are next to the vulture restaurant for efficiency in provisioning, particularly towards the, the fledgling stage. The fledging stage when the fledgings they leave the nest at that time just before they leave they leave with high demands for food so the parents need to be near the food source so this is how they are also clustered um, in the nesting area and then um over the years we've seen quite an um, impressive increases in the number of birds that are that are nesting from the first 11 that we've seen to 42 successful nests in 2022. So that is quite impressive. It means that these birds are doing well and um, something uh, positive is coming out of the, this private property. It means that something is being done all right for the birds, at least the birds appreciate it. And they, this is shown by the number of, uh, of placements that are coming out every year. All right, and so maybe just to play here in 2019 when we had a lot of failed nests, this was because of the windstorm that happened um, in August. And when we went for the service soon after the windstorm, found quite a lot of dead babies on the ground, uh, nests blown out, 
I remember there was even one kick that was between the two chunks. And the, the parent was feeding it from the, the ground. The baby could not move back up because it was it could not fly yet. And the parent could not lift the baby out so that it was just stuck in there between two chunks. But the parent was feeding it well. So it could just look quite well. It was put on um, the side. But I lost that picture, unfortunately. But this is um, a, a sign of what could happen in a breeding uh, season. You know, you can have natural disasters, you can have um, things like maybe pestilence disease coming in. But generally, the, the property is doing well in terms of numbers, and we've seen that um, a large increase. Right. And typically, this is what we've seen when you approach a nest, the parents see you and they stand, they stand in, they want to see what is happening. And then eventually they will fly off. Okay. And as they're flying off, the beautiful thing about this is then you can age the bed. So you can be able to collect data on who is breeding and how old they are. And over the initially in the first uh, two, three years, we had a lot of sub adult birds breeding. Um, these were the ones that set up, and the, most of them seem to have stayed because now we seem to be breeding more adults. And so, of course, some sub adults as well come in. So, all right. And um, by the end of September, this is what it typically looks like. Um, the baby is doing well, they are um, well fed, and um, going for the last lap before they can leave the nest. All right. So, it means that they are getting enough food in this area, and uh, the babies seem to do well. All right. And um, outside, besides the, the vulture restaurant that I, I mentioned earlier, there are some actions that the, uh, the private property, the property is doing um, to conserve the landscape, the vultures, and for other species, of course. Fire management is one, because normally when you have fires like this, it means that you destroy the, in a, in a way, if you don't really uh, control the fire, you can, um, the baby was on which the birds depend, so you need to manage the fire. Of course, uh, fire is an important um, factor in savannah landscapes, but they need to be con it needs to be controlled still. So, in fire management, uh, it's one of the things that the property is doing to help to move, uh, move towards um, uh, the resident conservation, and this benefits the vultures um, directly. Um, anti poaching is another because if you've got high poaching incidences, then it means that you are using your base resource in this case, it's heavy because mostly poachers will um, focus or the target heavy boss. So if there's anti poaching, then it means that your base population, which is you know, large mammals, is protected. And there's also the presence of carnivores, very important for vultures because. These are the, the engineers that will kill the, the herbivores or they will predate on the herbivores and vultures can also get access to, to, the, to, to their food. All right. And of course, these are some of the herbivores that are on the on the property. So the property gives a, a good food source for the vultures. It's the wildlife and as well the vulture restaurant that was set mostly benefits from uh, cattle mortalities, health mortalities, um, large cattle mortalities, and that supplements what the wildlife um, is giving for uh, the vultures, right? And um, eventually, the idea is that we move towards um, establishing the vulture safe zone um, in the area where we have the two properties and then the surrounding areas as well being involved in vulture conservation because having only the property, the Shaman holistic being uh, involved in vulture conservation, yes, it works, but it works even better if the neighbors are involved because vultures by nature are not, um, you know, they don't occupy very small spaces, they occupy large landscapes, vast landscapes. So it means that you need to speak to your communities, you need to speak to your neighbors. And this is something that we've started to do. And we are working towards at least having the neighbors around this, what we are calling a core area or core breeding area being involved 
we also conservation so there's a lot of community engagement we've also started working on um, tagging the vouchers so that we see where they are going so that we can actually have targeted um engagements and of course there's a lot of collaboration because these load owners are various people in various interests so you need a lot of collaboration even with government departments All right and then um okay um All right, so this is an example of what um, the tagging looks like. And it's interestingly as well, or maybe importantly, we find that this area is um, important even regionally. This is a bed that was tagged in South Africa. The 301 was tagged in South Africa and uh, it was using the culture restaurant um, of Shangan Holistic. So this is an area that is getting more and more important even for regional bed. As I said, vouchers are wide ranging so likely uh, this is one of their stopovers not likely but this is one of their stop important stopovers where they can find food all right so with taking here we then get to see um, how they are using the landscape okay and uh when you're taking it could get interesting i don't know if you can see the that's a feather might feel that as soon as i got hold of the bed all these things came in and they were <laughs> in my shirt everywhere, you know, and uh, I had to hold the bed and make sure that people get that the, the, the mite out of out of my shirt. So yeah, it can get interesting as we are working with um, with vouchers. And uh, I mentioned earlier that we also work with communities. We started talking to Tanzanian logistics neighbors, and um, people are very keen to to be involved. Um, to be involved in anti poaching in learning more about vouchers and uh, generally doing conservation work. Um, and one of the highlighted things uh, was that there is a lot of um, there's lack of information, and so people are very keen to learn. And as they learn, um, things get to change in the way they interact with the environment. So it's one of the target areas that we focused on, particularly. Uh, to move towards the conservation of vouchers. Okay. All right. And um, I have to say that generally the beds are doing well on the on the on the property. There is a area now with a very, very full crop. So food is always available and the beds are ready to, to, to eat it. And um, so this is ideally where we are moving towards where we have plenty of these, maybe even more than we see on this picture. Uh, we have a lot of white bed vouchers, a lot of other vouchers coming in and having this place becoming an important core area, breeding and foraging um, area for, for, for vouchers. So this is something we are moving towards um, with uh, private uh, landowners and also even including um, the surrounding communities in this initiative. Because there's quite a, a large appreciation of how important these beds are even in the communities because they will tell us that, well, if I have, um, if I can't find my beast, for example, my my bull or my cow, if um, I go out in the morning and I see vultures in the sky, then I'm, I know exactly where to go. Uh, perhaps maybe my, my, my cow or my cow is dying to eat. These act as important indicators of what is happening in the landscape. So generally, there's an appreciation of what how the beds are very important, and people are willing to, to conserve them. And um, we, we hope to move beyond just this field to have a lot more beds coming into the area and increasing in numbers, particularly given the global crisis that we have for vultures um, uh, currently. Okay. So yeah, so that is the work that is being done um, on Shangani Holistic. And um, I'd like to thank um, the Oppenheimer Generations Research and Conservation and all the people on uh, Shangani Holistic and many enthusiastic researchers that are involved in this work and particularly to the viewers as well that are watching this now. Right. I think that is all for me. Thank you very much. And um, I hope um, it, it's, it's been exciting as it is for, for us as we work 
um, and consuming vouchers. So this is maybe a, the voucher restaurant where the birds have done the work and now we only have bones. And normally what you do when you get here is you try and um, and uh, crack as many bones and just make them into smaller uh, fragments so that um, the birds can actually use just the bone for calcium. So it's some of the exciting work we've been doing and we hope to continue doing, working towards um, setting up Vulture safe zones, getting communities involved, getting everyone involved for the conservation of this. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Josephine and Lovelater, for not only shedding light on probably one of the most or the, the one of the most important groups of raptors in, in Africa, but also for representing the women in, in conservation uh, here in Africa, you guys are doing phenomenal work and um, it's absolutely wonderful to, to see it happening. So thank you guys so much for, for coming and sharing that, uh, that, that your knowledge with us. And of course, thanks again to, to, um, to Simon for that, uh, that, that field trip. Um, perfect. So we've come to the time uh, of our session that I enjoy the most, and that's getting to know our audience a little better. Uh, this is an opportunity for you guys to, to, Con uh, connect with us um ask your burning questions i believe uh josephine is in in the audience tonight so you'll be able to ask her uh, any questions regarding her work as well as uh love data of, of, of course is, is is still here with us tonight so if you guys would like to ask your questions you can do it in two ways you can either put it into the chat if you don't want to speak um the the chat if you go down to the bottom of your of your screen at that uh tool toolbox there just click on the chat and type in your your question there or if you look at the reactions button if you'd like to to ask us in person click click the reactions button and raise your hand um i see the first question already from uh, roland roland please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question can you hear me we yeah can we, can, we can hear you perfectly okay my name is roland goods uh, i'm a south african game years um, working as the warden of Kasama National Park and then moving down to Luwenge Luwana Mavinga which is on the Zambian Namibian border. Um, I have a question and a comment for Love, Love Later. Okay the first is the question now we have issues with uh, anthrax um, in that, in the area down uh, on the Namibian border area in uh, Luwengi, Luwana, Mavinga. And my question relates to the spreading of anthrax spores. Now, I understand once the, uh, the, uh, the meat or whatever offal has been digested, it's okay. But what happens about spores on the outer surface of the, of the bird, on its feathers, on its talons, on its beak? Is it possible for those uh, spores to be uh, uh, moved to other uh, to other areas? So that's my question. And then the second, uh, I'll deal with both of them. The second is that I grew up in the rural areas of KwaZulu Natal and uh, interacted with the Zulu people um, and the whole thing of traditional healers, um, basically. Uh, are divided into in, traditionally into two parts, into two uh, groups. One is called uh, an, an Inyanga. An Inyanga is a herbalist, that is the, the pharmacist. And the other is a Sangoma, like a psychologist that can communicate with the ancestral spirits. Now, there is a, quite a big change in the last maybe 10 years, uh, the difference between rural and urban uh, beliefs, um, and especially now in the urban commercialization where uh, the two, the Nyanga and Sangoma, and they don't have the same ethical training that, that they had in the past days, and it's become, they've been rolled into one. And uh, the issue with uh, vulture pots, especially the heads, um, where they believe if you put it now to, you know, the commercial in the, in the, the lotto by seeing into the future 
So there's a real problem with the commercialization and there's a need, and this is my thing, is is the education at the schools, even in, in especially actually now in urban areas, with the understanding of the importance of endangered species, in this case vultures, uh, and that the fact that uh, you know having a, a vulture skull under your pillow is not going to win you the lotto. So it's just a, an idea, uh, and also the interaction with the traditional healers both the Sangomas and the Inyangas, um, in the whole ethical practice, in the harvesting um, of uh, whether it's plants or, or birds or mammals or whatever uh, that they are dealing with as a medicine. So uh, that's the second part of, of an observation and a suggestion. So the first thing is about the spread of anthrax. And then what has been done about education in formal schools in uh, urban areas. Perfect. Thanks, Roland. Uh, Love Letter, are you there? Would you like to respond to that? Uh, thank you, Kainan. Uh, thank you, Roland, for your questions. Uh, on the issue of uh, anthrax spores, um, definitely um, the spores on the outside of the vulture definitely um, are still a danger to the environment because the body of the vulture on the outside is not acidic. So probably those spores may even end up in the water when the birds bath. It's only the spores, I mean, it's only the spores in the, that get into the stomach um, that become inactivated. And um, that is the bit that makes the vultures special from the other carnivores because even if they feed on those spores, um, they can remain active for a long time, like you said. And then on the issue of um, the traditional healers, you are right, um, they are grouped differently. And uh, in Zimbabwe, we've seen that they've got about four or five different groups and not all of them use animal body parts. Like you say, some of them are herbalists, um, some of them are prophets, they see into the future, but they do not use um, wildlife um, as, as part of their healing um, processes. But what we also found out here is that um, a lot of the initiation of the traditional healers actually uses vulture bonds. So there may be some that do not use them, but have had them used on them. So you can imagine if for every traditional healer that goes through uh, the training process, the initiation part then uh, has some vulture bonds that are being used and it's different per country, the, the, the way in which they are grouped. I don't know if it's per country or per, per culture because there are some cultures that are shared uh, or are common across countries. So it's also something that we don't understand, but I, I, we've come to appreciate that the way in which they are grouped differs and not all of them uh, use um, animal parts or vultures. And yes, you are right. For those ones, uh, there are some that just use plants. And traditionally, um, traditional healers that were using plants were actually harvesting in a better way than pharmaceuticals, because it was always agreed that when you are uh, when you are getting back or harvesting back from an animal, you only get from the east side of the plant, so you don't destroy the whole, whole plant. You don't drink back. If you are getting roots. Um, I think I'm, hi. Hello, yes, I'm listening. You're still there, yeah. Hi, oh, okay, Kellen, I had frozen. I thought it was me, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, oh, thank so you, I'm carrying the, on. Okay, for the, for okay. the plants, yeah. And then even when they were harvesting roots, it was harvesting from the east side and then cover it up to allow the plant to recover, which was a more uh, environmentally friendly way of harvesting. Uh, but with um, a more sophisticated and more corrupt traditional healers now, I don't know if they still all do that, but it, definitely in terms of plant use, they were even better than um, pharmaceutical companies in the way that they were harvesting. And a lot of the work that is being done by us and by a lot of other conservation groups in terms of vulture conservation has actually been focused on education and awareness focusing on, on, on different uh, groups of people, adults, traditional healers, communities, schools. So there, there's really been a huge drive to actually do a lot of education and awareness work 
Um, and uh, in some countries, um, there is conservation work is also part has become part of their curriculum, which is advantageous. But uh, in the rest, we really need to be deliberate about reaching out to to schools. Okay, um, I, I, I thank you for that. Yes, very complimentary. Well, it did worry me about the spores being carried, and so you confirmed my 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 uh, understanding that they are carried um, to where that where the vultures move to. Um, the issue um, working with the traditional healers. Uh, when I was with the Natal Parks Board, we worked very closely with the the Association of Traditional Healers. And um, we set up a herbal nursery in Silver Glen, just outside of Durban, um, to, to grow uh, artificially uh, medicinal plants. The problem is, and, and, and dealing with, uh, with at, at that level, uh, there is uh, the traditional ethical values. The problem is that it's become so commercialized uh, today that uh, you get these uh, uh, pharmacies like uh, uh, like a Metcam type uh, pharmacy where uh, to where these uh, various things are sold, not just the plants, not just the the, the actual physical material to eat, but then the the, the talisman, the tokens, um, and the young people uh, believing that uh, they can win the lotto, uh, and it really has very little to do with the traditional values and knowledge more about the commercialization. So there is a big problem there with the commercialization of traditional uh, medicines and talisman. So that is an area that I'm, I think with the traditional structures, fantastic, but we need to deal with the fly by night, people want to make a quick buck, setting up a pharmacy, uh, a so-called pharmacy that probably they not know nothing about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy. And, and um, um, it means really there needs to be a lot of engagement of the wildlife departments representing government in that, because they have the ability to then um, legally engage or stop um, such practices uh, more than us. We can do that. But yeah, you're right. We actually need to engage them um, and engage everyone from the top because there needs to be actually rules and laws in place that govern that. And in most of these cases, you'll find that the laws are there, but they're not being um, implemented. So yeah, we need to engage everyone. Yeah, I think you're right there, uh, Love Later. I think that's that's in general conservation. In in, in general, is the the laws are great. Uh, the implementation of it is uh, it tends to be the the issue. Um, I see we've got Doctor Tadai uh, Tadio Rusuk, uh, Rusoke. I I hope I pronounce that correctly. Um, they've got two questions uh, for, I think it's Josephine. Uh, the first is in terms of IUC and categorization, what level of status are the vultures? Um, well, they, they are a number of vultures. So so I think uh, Josephine, if you want to clarify that. And the second, the second uh, question was in terms of disease spread, aren't vultures at threat of contracting zoonosis from carcasses of livestock? So yeah. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Josephine. All right. Um, so I've uh, put a list of the vouchers in their states uh, according to the IUCN uh, red list. So you find that the white bait voucher is critically endangered. Lapid face voucher is endangered. The white headed voucher critically endangered. Wooded voucher critically endangered. Cape voucher is uh, vulnerable. And then um, our palm nut voucher, which mostly feeds on palm nuts, is least concerned. So the, the the vouchers that we have occurring in Zimbabwe are all in the red zone. So they are not doing well at all. Um, so that, that's the first one. And then in terms of uh, contracting zoonotic diseases, um, no, I would say no. Um, if we're talking of... Um, this is like foot and mouth anthrax, then it's unlikely like La Love Letter um, explained. But during the outbreak of um, even influenza, there were some cases where birds uh, 
between themselves were passing the, the disease, but not from the carcasses. So yes, they can get zoonotic diseases from other birds, but not from the carcasses that they're feeding on. So I hope that's that's clear. Yeah, that makes uh, that makes sense. Thank you, Josephine. Yes. Um, right. Brian, good to see you. I see your hand is raised there. Go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kaylin, for the opportunity, and I'm happy always to be here. Uh, to love later and Josephine, I'm also uh, expressing my uh, congratulations on the very informative presentation. But then now I have a question, and uh, there might be two. Uh, one is about the vulture safe zones in Zimbabwe. Now I'm 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 relating this to India, where they uh, established safe zones after burning the diclofenac, which was the threat in India. Now coming to Zimbabwe, uh, I, I take it in the context of uh, the threats that are uh, facing African vultures, where we have poisoning and uh, electrocution, um, I mean, um, other, other, among other threats. So then how did you or Zimbabwe made it possible to categorize a place or a habitat as a vulture safe zone, having in mind all these other threats, because I'm trying to have the understanding of safe zone as a place with almost zero level of threats. Yeah, that is one. And number two, if I'll be allowed to ask them once, number two would be about uh, vulture restaurants. Yeah, I'm trying to understand how effective or rather how best it works because from my understanding is that uh, the vultures are not as easy to habituate. And so then uh, if the restaurants are for providing what we'd call safe food for them, free of poison, and now, I'm trying to think that maybe at some point they'd want to go forage uh, away from the areas where they get fed. How does it become effective with the vulture restaurant aspect or concept? Thank you. Perfect. I think Josephine, uh, if you'd like to answer that, that's that would be great. Okay. Um, so for for the voucher restaurant, um, the idea is um, to provide food in places where they are wide, uh, they, they are mostly uh, using. So what has uh, happened with the restaurants that we have uh, in, in Zimbabwe is uh, people identify the places where they are mostly okay in terms of foraging and uh, nesting as well. So that's where you would set a voucher restaurant. So the idea is not to habituate the beds, but just to provide extra safe food, as you said. So we do get the beds um, uh, coming back to, to those places all the time. For some of the places, you put out a carcass in a few minutes, you have the beds um, there already. So I, I think, yes, we are getting effective. I hope I have answered the question. Um, in terms of voucher restaurants, I think it's working. The, the the key thing that we would need to keep um, uh, to to keep aware of or to, to 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 keep looking out for is that the food that we are providing is actually safe food, uh, free of lead, for example, and free of um, veterinary chemicals that may damage or that may that may poison the birds. Yes. And then in terms of voucher safe zones, maybe I will start to answer and then maybe love the check and come in as well. So zero threats for voucher uh, for, for voucher, voucher safe zones is um, a, a, a desired goal. But what we have started to do is in the areas where there have been a lot of um, work in terms of uh, awareness, education, and involving communities to take up 
the protection of vouchers, uh, getting involved in uh, nesting surveys, uh, doing anti-poaching patrols, removing snares and things like that. Those are the places that we have targeted for setting up voucher safe zones. So it's, it's not that we are um, already targeting places that have got zero threats, but we are targeting places where there are a lot of efforts that are already being done and uh, working towards zero threats. All right, I, I love later, I think maybe you can add on to, to, to those questions. Thank you, Josephine. Um, thank you, Brian, for your question. Um, like you realize that in India, they were dealing with one challenge, one threat. And in Africa, we are dealing with many. And as Josephine says, we've identified areas where there are threats that we can eliminate. Uh, threats of poisoning, uh, increasing education and awareness, um, the threat of uh, um, um, an unsuitable environment. Those are the things um, that we've managed to eliminate from those areas. And um, in South Africa, we have uh, one voucher safe zone that has um, a power line running through it. Uh, but since uh, we started implementing our work and eliminating all the other threats, we have seen that vouchers have actually started um, nesting in that site, which is good. Um, but there's still the threat of that power line and uh, yeah, it, it exists. And in the one that we have in Zimbabwe, we have um, the challenge of lead in there. Um, They're still using uh, lead ammunition. So like Josephine says, these are not areas that are now totally safe, but where efforts have been made to eliminate some threats and efforts are being made to, to eliminate the remaining ones. Uh, we've had a voucher a, a, a safe zone in place in Zimbabwe for four years. And in those four years, we've not lost any vultures to, to, to any human related threats. So I think um, it's work in progress, but it's going well. All right, thank you so much. Perfect. I think that was a yeah that was a good explanation of of your vulture vulture safe zones. Um, I think we're gonna finish off uh, the session with one last question from Willis in the chat. Um, he wants to know have uh, he's been wondering uh, if vultures range uh, vultures range extends to the coast. So, for example, Southern Africa uh, or uh, South African and East African coasts. Have there been any sightings of vultures feeding on dead marine life or vultures just, or are they just restricted to the plains? Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, later you're welcome to you, Jos Josephine. You can uh, uh, also let us know from your side. The bearded vulture has been seen uh, to feed on some um, water living species, both freshwater and uh, marine so we know that it ranges that far off okay. uh, yes um i think i can answer for the white-headed vulture that um i have seen on the coast of mozambique so i mean, i didn't see it feeding but i'm sure they also just fly above the coast um searching for food because they nest not not so far from the coast so it is possible that they are in those areas yes Right. Yeah, I think from my side, I've had reports, um, unconfirmed, of course, but I've had reports of individuals uh, recording palm nut vultures feeding on carcasses of sharks that had been finned in Mozambique that were found on the coast. Um, so I think definitely the possibility is there. Um, if there's a if there's a food source uh, and there are vultures in the area, you'll probably get some of them uh, visiting the coast. So uh, definitely, again, I'd like to thank uh, our, our speakers for taking the time uh, to come and chat to us all um, and great work that you both have been doing uh, up in Zimbabwe, um, flying the, the, the flag high for vulture conservation uh, in Africa. So thank you very much for your time, for your knowledge, really appreciate it. Um, and to our audience, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Please, please, please join us again next week, Wednesday, same time, same place at seven o'clock South African time. We are going to have a, a very special um, uh, session with two extremely talented and dedicated conservationists uh, speaking about urban 
raptors and how uh, raptors have uh, have adapted to be in urban spaces. They are phenomenal speakers. I have had the the pleasure of of, of uh, working with them and speaking with, uh, or listening to them or listening to them present at other conferences. And I tell you right now, you are in for a treat. So join us next week, same time, same place. And once again, remember to share those uh, posters that uh, that we've sent through to your emails. Um, until next week, I look forward to seeing you guys all again. Take care. Good night.